we're going to continue from last week's discussion where we spoke about how this world, which is Olam, is really concealment of godliness, which means in order for this world to exist and to feel as an existence, God had to remove, so to speak, not to remove, but to block his light. And the idea of Mashiach is to create a space here in this world where God's light could once again shine. And we spoke very briefly about it. Uh, we really focused on why this world is the ultimate world rather than the spiritual worlds. And today we will go a little bit deeper into it and understand how, if this world is the ultimate, which means revealing godliness is the ultimate, how do we accomplish it? How, how do we accomplish this? And that's really uh, the question of tonight's class. Uh, we are going to discuss how the coming of Mashiach, the redemption, is not just a reward for our good behavior, for doing what we need to do, whether it's today or last year or in previous generations, but rather it's the result of our actions. So that's going to be one of the points that we're going to make tonight. Again, uh, rather than looking at the coming of Mashiach, the redemption, the state of the world in the future, as a reward for what we have accomplished, of our, the reward of our actions, we see it instead as the result of our actions. So that's one point that we're going to make today. Another point that we're going to make is, Again, we're talking about how to get to redemption. How do we reveal godliness in this world? Once godliness is revealed in this world, then all the other amazing things that we spoke about are going to become a reality. So mitzvahs, if we think about mitzvahs, are, are the result of mitzvahs is to bring godliness into this world. Our mitzvahs, how much do they really affect the world? And if I make a, a do a mitzvah here, Right now, let's say I make a bracha on my, on my glass of water. So I make, I make a bracha. How is that affected? How is that affected the rest of the world? So that I understand that now there is a, there could be potentially a revelation of God as a result of my bracha right here in my, in my living room. But how can I affect that same revelation of God in the entire world? How do, we, how do we accomplish that? So that's the second thing that we are going to focus on. Understanding how the revelation of godliness, the coming of Mashiach, the redemption, is something that can affect through our mitzvahs, through our mitzvot, we can affect the entire world. So that's the second point that we're going to, the second idea that we're going to uh, discuss. And then the third idea that we're going to discuss this evening is the idea that we are partners with God in his work of creation. What does it mean to be a partner? What are the benefits of a partner? How does that change uh, being a partner? How does that change our perception and function in this world, in the sense of in relationship, in relationship to, to the mitzvahs. Which means, what difference does it make if I'm a partner or I'm just doing what I need to do? Uh, how does that really make a difference in, in, my, in my actions, in my behavior? And what is my ultimate goal? So that's, that's, those are the three points that we're going to make tonight. And we're going to start with... Uh, talking about reward versus result, we are going to start with a little exercise. 
uh, which can be found on page 97 for the benefit of those who do not, who might not have a book, um, going to read it. So page 97, exercise 3.1, we, we want to uh, choose a mitzvah. Think of a mitzvah, any mitzvah that you do regularly, uh, whether it's keeping kosher, Shabbat services, giving charity, uh, putting on tefillin, studying Torah, uh, uh, respecting one's parents. It could be any mitzvah. And now think to yourself, why do you do this mitzvah? And select one or more of the following reasons. So you could do a multiple reason, you do all the reasons, you could do some of the reasons or one of the reasons. So maybe you do it because God said so. Is that perhaps the reason? It makes my life more orderly and stable. It makes my life more spiritual. It strengthens my Jewish identity. It just feels like the right thing to do. It makes the world a better place. I believe that God will reward me for doing my mitzvot. I'm afraid to disobey God, or perhaps another reason. So it's interesting that this text, this exercise, really uh, encompasses so many different reasons, but reasons that are truly the motivation for many people's mitzvot. Uh, pe some people give charity because it makes the world a better place. Some people do give charity because God said so. Uh, some people give charity because they're afraid that if they don't, you know, maybe there's a consequence. And some people do it just because I'm Jewish, and this is what I do as a Jew, and therefore I... Uh, you know, this, this strengthens my Jewish, my Jewish identity, or it just feels right. So this concept of reward and punishment, if you remember we, we, we discussed um, in last week's lesson, we went through the 13 principles of faith recorded by Maimonides. The 11th one being the, uh, excuse me, the 12th one being the belief in the coming of Mashiach, and the 13th one being the belief in Tchiat Hametim, which is the resurrection of the dead. And we spoke about how these uh, 13 principles of faith are central principles. And, but let, well, let's go back to, we really focused on 12 and 13, and that's what this uh, course is based on. But we're going to go back to text number 11 because text num uh, uh, principle number 11, because principle number 11 actually leads into principle number 12 and 13. So in principle number uh, 11, we spoke about the belief in reward and punishment, which means that there's an idea of consequences for our actions. Do something good. There'll be a good uh, consequence. If you do something bad, and we think we, we may have touched upon it, I think we might have spoken about the idea of, uh, you know, if, if, we, if, if, if a child, I remember if it was last week, or uh, we spoke about if a, a, a child uh, takes a knife or goes into the street, so or we, we, ex we, we have to explain to the child the consequences. So we, we know the person walks into the street for this car coming, there's going to be a consequence for, consequence for their actions. It's not a punishment, right? It's a consequence. So there are rewards and punishments are really consequences for our actions. So if we, if we look in uh, the, the portion in Bechukosai, which was uh, actually last week's Torah portion, the very first verse of the second of last week's Torah, last week we had a double portion. And it says in Bechukosai Telecho, which is text number one, if you follow my statutes and keep my commandments and observe them, I will provide you rains in their proper time. The earth will give its produce and the trees of the field will yield their fruits. So, yes, there's a consequence. There's a prize. There's a payment for our actions. So the payment uh, could be in this world, right? So uh, a person gives tzedakah. Uh, many, there are a number of people have told me that they've either made a commitment to give tzedakah, uh, to give charity, or, or they gave charity, um, and immediately afterwards, uh, they received something that was completely unexpected. Um, 
In fact, I'm on a, a group, a uh, WhatsApp group of Chabad rabbis. I'll give you a little secret. And this group is a group uh, that where, where money matters are discussed, financial. Um, you know, talking about how to, you know, different ideas of, in, in, in securing the funds that we need to be able to uh, continue our operations, build our operations and succeed, etc. So there was an initiative that was made last year, um, right before Rosh Hashanah, it was in the summer. And the initiative was, I think it's, it's, it really is an inspiring initiative. The initiative was that any unexpected gifts that the group receives individually, they will give 10% of that. Now, you know, usually you have 10%, which is Misa, which is a, a gift away, usually for your own income. And this was that you should allocate 10% of an un, any unexpected gifts during a, either for two weeks, for a certain amount of time, to Chabad rabbis who are less fortunate. So keeping within the group, but helping others. It's a wonderful, wonderful initiative. And the stories that were coming out right after of people who took on the resolution and started to uh, bring in unexpected donations. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, and I have to say that I experienced it as well. And so what happened was I gave, I gave, and I just, you know, it's just a nice story. I gave a donation and this was months. I, I gave a donation at that time to a Chabad rabbi that I'm close to that is fairly new on the job. And I knew that he can I actually gave to a few that, that, that I knew that they, they could use the support. So I gave them, I made this resolution for maybe a month or whatever, I think the Rosh Hashanah, whatever it was. So I gave it to one of them. And then several months later, it was in December, someone, uh, one of these rabbis that I that I'd given uh, some support to, so they made a donation, unexpected donation to our Chabad. So I called them, I said, what's going on? Why are you making a donation? What is this for? So he said, I was inspired by your, uh, you know, because I told him why I was, he was, he, 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 was, he was surprised that I had given him a donation. And he, so and I explained to him that we're, I'm on this group and, and we had made this resolution. And so he told me at this time, in, this, in the beginning of December, maybe it was, he said that he also, uh, he decided that he was going to make this resolution and try to give 10% of, um, any unexpected gifts that come in within 24 hours that he made this um, uh, this uh, this resolution, he got a gift of $1,800, and for him it was very very significant. Uh, it's, it's a, generally it's a significant donation, uh, but for him it covers a lot more than it covers in my budget. It was it was a very significant donation, and so he had given me the $180. So this is interesting. It was right before the end of the year, and I said to myself, you know. I'm not ready right now to give 10%, just to take that on, but I'm going to take on 5% for the next couple of weeks. I'm gonna take on 5% of any unexpected donations. I'm going to, uh, to give it away. 5%, you know, I can, I can at that time I felt I, I could handle it. So again, this is not my responsibility. My responsibility is 10% of my own income that I make personally. So I'm giving myself a paycheck at 10% from any paycheck that I make goes to charity. Um, this is, you know, from the, from the general, the, the Chabad uh, account. An hour later, an hour later, I'm standing, someone came to my home and says to me, you know, I wanted to make a contribution, another a small contribution towards the building fund. As we had spoken, whatever, we had spoken some time before. Um, and he said, I'd like to make... I'm going to be sending you a check before the end of the month of $3,600. So, okay, so you get rewards, sometimes even immediate rewards here in this world. 
So there is such a concept of, of consequences and reward in this world, and sometimes we see them immediately. But that's not the ultimate reward of, of why we do a mitzvah. Then there's also reward, which we talk about after 120. Person passes away. They go up to Gan Eden, to, to, to paradise. And they spend their time in, in, in Gan Eden as a reward, studying Torah and, and embar embarking in the light of Hashem, uh, as a reward for their study of Torah and their mitzvot that they did in this world. If a person hadn't uh, studied Torah or done that many mitzvot, of course his children, can uh, send mail by doing studying Torah and doing mitzvot, or anybody, for that matter, is able to do that, to be able to benefit them so that they could um, have that reward as well and that benefit. But ultimately, there is the reward, which is the final redemption that we will experience, and that is the ultimate of all rewards. So we're going to add, we're going to review that in a text from the Alter Rebbe in Tanya. And this is text number two. And we're going to, the Alter Rebbe is going to add a new dimension, which is going to enhance our appreciation for the concept of redemption and what it's going to do for us. So text number two, Alter Rebbe writes as follows. This ultimate perfection of the age of Mashiach and the resurrection, namely the revelation of the infinite radiance of God in this physical world, which is absence now, absent now because this world is called Olam, depends, which is concealment, and that's the, the only way that God can create an entity up, uh, that feels it's outside of God. Again, nothing's outside of God, but the one that feels it's independent was by concealing the light. So how do we bring this light back in? It depends on our actions and our work throughout the duration of exile. That is what the revelation depends on, our mitzvahs. But then he adds another, that, that's something that we discussed last week, and that's sort of a summary. But al Rebbe adds something uh, additional here. And he says, for the reward of a mitzvah is the result of the mitzvah itself. This is because with the performance of a mitzvah, one elicits, elicits God's infinite radiance so that it descends into and is integrated within the physical matter of this world. So again, we have the physical world is going to change um, because that is the, 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 the world will come, become, as we said last week, and as Alter Rebbe writes here, the ultimate state of perfection is going to happen physically as well when Mashiach comes. Of course, we're going to have the spiritual element of Mashiach, which is the dwelling place for God in this world, God's presence, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight. But the third thing is that we accomplish, accomplish this through doing mitzvahs. Um, and finally, we're adding that the reward of the mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. So what, is, what does it mean the reward of a mitzvah is the mitzvah itself? And this is the point that the, the, the idea, one of the general ideas that I mentioned right when I, when I, when I began tonight, that mitzvahs, the, the, the reward, the ultimate reward uh, and the purpose of a mitzvah is not the reward, so to speak, but is the result, which means it's not going to be a reward for doing such and such, but rather this is the natural result of doing a mitzvah is the mitzvah, is the light of Hashem that we're going to bring into this world. That is what we, are, we accomplish with a mitzvah. So again, it's not that we are going to do a mitzvah, and now God is going to say, okay, because you did this mitzvah, guess what? I'm going to bring an era of redemption one day. Because as long as the era of redemption is a reward, okay, so there's rewards now, there's rewards later, who knows what it's going to be? It's the whole concept of redemption becomes a distant thing. It's not a reality. It's not really connected to what I'm doing right now. It's something that might happen one day because of what I did right now. What we're saying is that it's very much, the redemption is very much related to the mitzvah that I'm doing right now. 
it's not something that's just going to come as a reward. Which means that when I made a bracha tonight on this glass of water, that is actually very much connected to redemption. It's not a separate thing. It's not like one day because I made a bracha and because I put on filling and because I lit the Shabbos candles and I was kind to another person and I honored my parents. Therefore, I'm going to one day uh, receive a reward. And God says, oh, well, you've been such a good boy. Or you've been such a good girl. Uh, the world has been so wonderful and therefore I'm going to bring this world into a state of redemption. No. We are actually causing that redemption by making a bracha, by keeping Shabbos in, in whatever we do and always growing in that observance of Shabbos, by going to shul, by, by, by eating kosher, by making a bracha. All the mitzvahs that we do, they result in bringing this divine presence into the world. But then the question becomes, one second. And of course, we've answered this question. The question becomes, isn't God everywhere anywhere anyway? Which means I'm making this bracha to bring God's presence into this world. But God is everywhere. So what exactly am I doing? Am I bringing God to this place? God created this place. And God's existence is in every single place. So how do I understand it? So the idea that we've explained till now, we started to explain last week, which is that we are not bringing God here. We are revealing God into this, in this world, in this, in this place. And that is what we are accomplishing when we fulfill a mitzvah. And we're going to bring a beautiful, beautiful parable to be able to truly appreciate this concept. So one of the things that we spoke about last week, uh, a very central theme, was this idea that we are making this world into a dwelling place for Hashem, into a home for God. What's the difference between a home and uh, a home and a workplace or the home and being a guest in someone else's home? When I'm home, I am completely myself. You know, I was, I was saying to someone that I sort of, over the last six weeks, appreciated what Hashem uh, did to Abraham. We know that after Abraham, uh, our forefather Abraham, circumcised himself, it says that God made the, hot, the, the day very hot. You may remember this. God made the day very, very hot, exceedingly hot. Why? Because Abraham pitched his tent right in the middle where all the passerbys are going. And Hashem did not want that Abraham should have any guests who would bother him while he was going through this tremendous pain. However, Abraham sat. And he looked out and he was hoping. And then he got excited because he sees three guests that are coming. Abraham really wanted to see guests. So I didn't understand. If it was the benefit for Abraham not to have guests, don't send anyone. Why send the angels? And if he should have a guest, what difference did it make if it was an angel, if it was a human? So I came to appreciate it. This is my own little commentary. You know, I got a few people, calls and friends, people called. Uh, they wanted to come visit. Now, some days I was up to visits, and some days I wasn't up to visits. Say, so for the most part, I wasn't really up to any visits. There was a lot of discomfort. In the last couple of weeks, there was a lot of pain. But, Bar Hashem, I'm, I'm past it, hopefully, <laughs> for good. But, Bezat Hashem. But there were a few very, very close friends or family that came over that. I was completely comfortable. To the extent that I was so comfortable that even though I, I actually got dressed every single day, in fact, one of my friends came in and says, I don't understand why you, why you dress. You're not going anywhere. So I get dressed because I want to feel like a mensch every morning. So, so I, I, the, the idea is that 
in, in your home, you want to be able to feel so comfortable that, that you can be in your pajamas. And when, you're, when, when, when a person is, is sick, the, the, the people that come to visit, you want them to be people that you could feel, still feel at home, which means you don't want to have to start feeling your best. You know, a lot of people, when they're sick, they don't want to see people. You know, so a lot of times that's the last time you'll see them is before they get sick because it's very uncomfortable. You know, usually when we see people, if we're a woman, we have to put on makeup, if we're a man, I have to put on my tie, I have to dress up a little bit. We have to, we, we, we can't be completely ourselves in the presence of people who aren't family for the most part. And therefore, my idea, my, my thoughts were that Hashem said, okay, you can't have the regular passerbys come to Avraham because that is going to make you uncomfortable and therefore I'm going to make you very hot. But an angel, those are the people Avraham would really truly feel comfortable with. And therefore Hashem was able to send angels to Avraham's home. The idea is that in order to feel it, it, the, the difference between a home and any other place is that a home, one is truly, truly comfortable. One's truly oneself. It's always when I get home that I think to myself, oh my God, you know that conversation I had today? I should have said this and this and the other, right? Why? Because when you're home, you're so relaxed, you're so yourself, you start to think different. We're fully ourselves. And so creating a home for Hashem means that we are creating a place here in this world where Hashem's presence could be fully revealed. That is our goal. And that is the purpose of doing mitzvot. And that is what we're trying to accomplish. And that's what's going to happen with the coming of Mashiach, with the redemption. That we are going to see that revelation where God could be in this world in a, uh, in a revealed way. And how do we do that? We do that through mitzvot. So God gave us mitzvot. He gave us opportunity to be able to do it. So here's the parable that I, that I, wanted, I wanted to share. We all know what this is, right? Raise your hand if you've ever played or tried to, put, tried to play. You put your fingers on the, on, the, on the keyboard. Okay, I've also, I've tried. Haven't gotten too far. But I have one. Because my wife is very good. And the kids are very good. But not me. I've got other, other, uh, other uh, talents, thank God. But uh, not music. I could still play the same song that I learned when I was 10 years old with one finger. <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> Just no one can sing along with it because it's a little slow. But anyway, the, 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 here's, here's what I want to say about this, this parable. We all know what it is, right? So here we have three worlds. World number one is our world. Where we have pianos and we know what the pianos are. And people use the piano and they create music or play music. Then we have a second world. Imagine there was a second world where everything was exactly as it is in this world. Everything. Human beings, the function of this world, everything was as this world. However, the one difference is that there was no music in this world. That's the only difference. So everything's the same, but there's no music. So what happens in the second world? In the second world, if someone saw a piano, what would happen? They would probably think that it's, you know, nice piece of furniture, nice decorative piece. You know, I, it actually looks very nice. I'll put some, some, uh, some pictures on it. I'll put some plants. Guess what? There are a lot of people who do that anyway here in this world, right? <laughs> <laughs> they don't buy it at all for music. They buy it just because it looks nice. It does look nice. Well, it depends what kind of piano you have. But you buy a nice piano if you can, and you use it for decoration. So that's world number two. But in world number two, they don't even know what it is. They don't even know that it has the ability to play music. But in world number two, there could be a person who recognizes that I don't know what it is, but it looks like it's a little bit more sophisticated than just a table or, 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 or a bench. There's something about it. I just don't know what it is. I got to figure it out. 
there is then a third world, a third reality. And you'll see that all these realities are within this world. The third reality is the world where of the woodpecker, where the, in the world of the woodpecker, all they see is a piece of wood. It's not even, it's not even decorative. It's simply a piece of wood that I'm going to peck at. And that is the third world. So this is our uh, uh, parable. The same object in all three worlds. The only difference is how they perceive these objects. In world number one, they see there's a musician. So the musician sees a piano, he goes over and he plays music. In world number two, they don't know, they don't recognize the beauty and the power of this instrument. And this instrument remains a decorative piece. In world number three, they just peck at it because they don't even recognize that it's a decorative piece. It's nothing, it's just a piece of wood. The same thing is true when it comes to mitzvot. The mitzvot were given to us to be able to elevate us, to be able to allow us to appreciate a higher reality in this world. That's what the mitzvot is. When we do a mitzvah, what we're doing is we're using this world for what it was meant for. What was it meant for? To reveal godliness, to create music. Otherwise, we're just sitting in this world and using it for decorative purposes. You know, I, I, I try to do what I, what I have to do to survive. I, I, I do the most. I'm trying to make my day beautiful, meaningful, and in any way I can. And then there are people who just take advantage of the world. You know, use it for their own benefit. So doing, what we're, what we're doing is we're seeing the mitzvah in, in a new way. That this is an opportunity for us to reveal a new dimension in this world, a new reality. How does it work? So we understand that the purpose of a mitzvah is to create that new reality, to bring that music into this world, the revelation of God. But let's get into a little bit more of how that works. How do we create a revelation of God in this world when we do a mitzvah? And what, what exactly has happened? And furthermore, as I uh, asked at the very beginning of the class, if I do a mitzvah and I create uh, spiritual energy right here by doing my mitzvah right here by making my blessing on my on my drink and I'm making spirit creating spiritual energy right here how does that affect any other part of the world which means if the idea of Mashiach and redemption is not just to bring redemption to my home the idea of redemption is even in Africa in in every part of the world every single corner of the world and even in the uninhabited places of the world godliness should be Revealed. The animals should feel it, should feel the godliness. Every place of the world. So how am I creating that uh, revelation when I'm making a blessing? So there's two ways of understanding the effect of the function of a mitzvah. Text number three, and then we'll read text number four. Text number three is an introduction. Text number four will actually talk about these two aspects of every single mitzvah that we do. Through the performance, of, you know, it seems almost funny. Like it seems like we've almost moved away from the real intricate ideas of Mashiach and redemption, which we'll get back to. You know, all the excitement which we started in the very first class. But we need to realize that our everyday actions really are very much connected, and that's what we're really going to do tonight. To recognize that our every action, Mashiach is not just a distant thought, and now it's a fascinating topic. So you know what? It's almost like the topic of, of what's going to happen after 120. This is more relevant. One would think the opposite, you know, because uh, people die every day. So that's more relevant. But what we're learning now is that the whole purpose of the world being created, and the whole purpose of souls coming down into this world, into the spiritual world, 
is for this world, is to do a mitzvah in this world and to reveal godliness in this world. Which means that we're now recognizing that the relevance of this world and of Mashiach and redemption is more significant than the class that we'll take about what happens after 120, even though that might be more fascinating. So the, the, there's a lot of fascinating things about Mashiach and redemption. And we're going to get back into them. Again, we did it in the first week. We sort of did it at the beginning of last week. And then we sort of moved out into this mitzvah thing, which seems unrelated. But as we will see tonight, redemption is so real and so um, important and relevant now to my life today. And when I make a bracha, when I do a mitzvah right now, this is something that is of utmost importance. And in fact, the greatest and most important thing that exists because it's the whole purpose of creation was for me to reveal for us together to reveal godliness in this world and so when i do a mitzvah right now that is bringing about the ultimate purpose um, into this world making it a reality so through the performance of a mitzvah again text number three we're on page 101 through the performance of a mitzvah, a person causes a flood of God's infinite light to descend from above and being clothed within the corporality of the world, within an object that was previously under the dominion of and whose existence depended upon the spiritual forces that obscure the godly reality. This includes all things that are kosher and permissible with which a mitzvah is then performed. For example, the parchment used in tefillin, a mezuzah, or a Torah scroll, an etrog, so long as it is not Arla, fruit from a tree's first three years, which are biblically prescribed, money given to charity, so long as it's not been dishonestly acquired, and similarly with other material things. When one uses these objects to perform God's mitzvah and thereby fulfill his expressed desire, their vivifying force ascends and is absorbed within God's infinite light. So we take the physical object and with, by taking this physical object, we are now revealing the spiritual energy that exists within. And then we continue with the two aspects of the mitzvah, which is what we wanted to get. Text number four, page 104. There are two aspects to every mitzvah. One aspect is the fact that with every mitzvah that we do, we fulfill God's will. In this regard, there is no difference between one mitzvah and the next. An individual fulfills a mitzvah not because of its unique qualities and its unique, its unique effects, but simply to carry out God's will. This aspect of the mitzvah is aptly demonstrated in the ob observation of Rav Shnir Zalman of the Adi in, ta in Torah, uh, look at the Torah, that if we were commanded to chop wood, we would do it in obedience to the divine will with the same enthusiasm as we would fulfill the mitzvah of tefillin. So, the first week after a person gets married, the excitement is so great that we're willing to do anything. It doesn't make a difference what it is. You want me to take out the garbage or take out the garbage? You start asking the person uh, three years later to take out the garbage one second. What? Who? Garbage? <laughs> or, or, or doing any other. Just, it's just a joke. But the, 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 the point is that when a person truly appreciates another person, it's doing what that other person needs that is relevant, not what the need is. Which means it doesn't really matter what I need to do for that person. If I love that person, I have a relationship with that person, if I want to fulfill what that person needs, so I'm going to do whatever it takes. It doesn't matter what it is. Now, of course, if it's something more pleasant, if the person wants me to uh, do something that's more pleasant, of course, it's, it's, it's nicer. But ultimately, it really doesn't matter what, what, what's, whatever it is I'm going to do. The second aspect of the mitzvah, but that's generally with every single mitzvah equally. Doesn't make a difference what the mitzvah is. The second aspect of a mitzvah is that each mitzvah brings a spiritual ref refinement to the individuals performing the mitzvah. Similarly, the mitzvah brings a spiritual refinement to the object with which it's performed and ultimately refines the world. And we'll talk about how we could ultimately refine the world. So again, 
The second aspect is the individual impact of that particular mitzvah. So first of all, the person who's doing the mitzvah, that particular mitzvah has a different kind of impact. Every mitzvah has a different kind of uh, emotional uh, impact, effect on the person, spiritual impact on the person, uh, physical impact on the person, as we will see. The, the, um, the second idea is that there is actually a refinement of the actual object. So let's say the, the citron that we're using as an etrope actually becomes a holy object. The leather straps of the tefillin become holy. And ultimately, because of that, the world around it also becomes holy and refined and spiritual, with, filled with, with spiritual energy, which we'll get to un understand how that works. The difference between these two elements is that with the first aspect, the specifics of the mitzvah are irrelevant. All mitzvahs are equal, for they are all equally God's will. By contrast, the second element highlights the significance of each mitzvah's specific details, for each mitzvah brings a dissimilar branch of spiritual enhancement to the soul, and it finds the wor world in a different way. So, again. First of all, what we're doing with the mitzvah is we're revealing in this world what there was already there, but we didn't previously see it, and that's the spiritual energy that we're bringing in this world. So the first function of a mitzvah is the general fulfillment of God's will. This is what God wants, and we're having a relationship with God, so therefore we do what it is. The second thing is uh, more specific, where there is a spiritual uh, refinement uh, that happens either to the person, to the object, or to the world around. So, we're taking these physical objects, we're using them, we're using these resources for Hashem. In the general way, when we look at mitzvahs from a general perspective, from the first way, one, I, one way of looking at it is, it won't make a difference whether or not I'm going to be I'm standing in the store, which means more, which, which is more significant when it comes to the spiritual, to the general uh, spiritual effect of a mitzvah. Standing and praying or studying Torah, giving charity, or standing in the supermarket buying food for my parents. Which one's more significant? So when it comes to the general idea that I'm doing the will of Hashem, it makes absolutely no difference. Whether you're putting on tefillin, standing in the supermarket buying some food, or helping uh, someone with their bags cross the street. They're all mitzvot, and they're all creating spiritual energy and revealing God's light into this world. It really doesn't make a difference what mitzvah, the specific mitzvah is. However, in the, in the uh, second way that we, we see a mitzvah, the specific uh, function of the mitzvah, it makes a very, very diff a big difference. Because again, it affects us in three different ways. Or it makes an effect in three different ways. Uh, the first one is it affects the person. And every mitzvah that we do affects us in a very different way. Here's some of the examples here. Um, so I I'm going to give tzedakah. That's the, the first picture on my right. So the give tzedakah. So giving tzedakah has an effect on me. How does giving tzedakah have an effect on me? Because every day that I give a coin to charity, and I try to do it every single morning, to give a coin to charity, makes, turns you into a giving person. It actually has an impact on the person. And every mitzvah has an impact on the person, an, an, a, a, an emotional impact, uh, a spiritual impact on the person. We become refined by doing a mitzvah, and that's the idea of a schar mitzvah mitzvah, right? The, the effect is the mitzvah itself. That we, the mitzvahs actually change us. This is the very the specific idea of a mitzvah that, look, look at, uh, by the way, uh, the, the, the concept of tefillin. One of the ideas that I started to share with Bar Mitzvah boys of the value of tefillin is besides that it's the will of Hashem, which unfortunately today is something 
children don't really relate to that much. But one of the things that I explain to uh, the children is that the impact that the tefillin is going to have on them, on their success in life, on their relationships, on their business, it's going to have a tremendous impact. They look at me, what do you mean? So I'm going to put this box on my arm and on my head, and it's going to change the way I do business one day. How? And the answer is very simple. Because you become, a, when you put on tefillin, on a very simple level, how it impacts us, because that's the first step of the, of the, of the, of in, the, in the second category, there's three steps. It impacts us because we become a committed person. I am now a person I've committed for my life to put on tefillin every single day. I'm now a committed person. And when I make a commitment that I keep every day, I train myself to become a committed person. And now I become committed to my relationship. I become committed in work. And that leads to success. So putting on tefillin every single day brings success in every part of life. And I think that it's something that and it's it's with every mitzvah in, in different ways, but I I I believe that tefillin really has that impact in in a, in a very real way. Okay, so that's the, the the first level in the second category. The second level in the second category is how the mitzvah brings spiritual refinement to the object. So if we want to talk about uh, an apple on Rosh Hashanah, and we're dipping that apple into honey, right? So that apple is now used for a mitzvah. We turn that apple into a simple, delicious fruit into something that's used for a mitzvah. And that creates spiritual energy in the apple. So understanding the personal get, the uh, benefit, the, the light of Hashem uh, that impacts our personal life is something that we could really understand very simply. Understanding how we can impact the very uh, item that we are doing the mitzvah with is something that we could appreciate. Again, bringing light into this world, into the world, which is the whole concept of geula of redemption. I don't remember if I mentioned this, and usually I look through uh, most of the course before uh, uh, before I start a course, but because of my uh, recovery, um, I, I haven't looked through the entire course. So it could be at some point this will be mentioned. But a very, very important difference between redemption, which is the revelation of Hashem, and exile is one letter, the letter Aleph. If you look at the Hebrew word for exile, it's Gola, or Galut, which comes from the root word Gola. Gimel Vav Lamed Hei. Geula, which is redemption, is the same letters, just with the added Aleph, which is the light, which represents, Aleph represents light, or, which is the light of Hashem. Which means the only difference between exile and redemption is one simple difference, light, light of Hashem. And that's what we're accomplishing through doing a mitzvah. So the third step in the second function is that not only do we make a uh, difference in the person who's doing the mitzvah and in the object that we do the mitzvah, but we're actually impacting the entire world through doing a mitzvah. Text number five. Right. Talking about our benefit, right? So the first one is, the first function we said is that we're doing a mitzvah simply because that's what God said. That's what God wants. And it doesn't make a difference what mitzvah it is. If it's giving charity, I'm doing it. If God wants me to dip the apple in the honey now, I'm going to do it. But in the second uh, model or function, uh, it makes a difference which mitzvah it is because every mitzvah is going to have an impact in a different way. Text number five. Does God truly mind if a person, this is from the Midrash, if a person slaughters an animal from the throat or slaughters it from the back of the neck, which means if the whole purpose of slaughtering an animal is because the divine will wants us to slaughter the animal in such a way, why does God care how we slaughter the animal? 
which means what difference is, does it make a difference if it's the neck or it's the back? We, slaughter the animal, meaning from God's perspective. Why would God tell us to do it in this specific way? Rather, says the Medrash, the mitzvahs were given only to refine the individuals who perform them. Which means that the purpose that Hashem, uh, the purpose why, why God, why Hashem has given us very specific mitzvahs is because through the mitzvot, Hashem allows us to refine ourselves, which means to bring godly light, godly energy into our own existence, which is bringing redemption to our own lives, to our personal lives, as well as bringing redemption to the item and the ultimate redemption, which is the ultimate revelation of godliness and light in this world, is when the whole world will see um, the, the revelation of God. And that happens through the very specifics of the mitzvahs. Each of these three levels, the specifics of the mitzvahs, of the mitzvot are, are, are significant. And this is why God has given us so many mitzvahs. If it was all about just doing what God wants, why does God have to give us so many mitzvahs? Let's have a look at the Midrash. It tells us uh, further, it's from the Midrash of Tanhuma. And it says, God did not leave anything in the world without providing the people of Israel with a means of performing a mitzvah with it. Which means there isn't a part of this world which doesn't have the ability to fulfill a mitzvah with it. Okay. A person proceeding to plow must heed, do not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You're not allowed to plow with these two things together. So the moment the person's plowing, there's already mitzvahs involved in plowing. So do not sow kilayim, which is a hybrid plantings in your vineyard. Reap when you reap your harvest in your field. Leave any forgotten sheaves for the poor. Thresh, do not muzzle an ox while it is threshing. Knead dough from the first of your kneading uh, of your of, of your kneading bowl. Separate some as chala as a gift to the priest. Remove eggs from a nest. Send away the mother bird. Slaughter a wild animal of a fowl. Cover its blood with soil. Plant a tree. Uh, it, it, I'm not going to go through all of them. And build a house and make sure there's a safety fence. Um, inscribe uh, these words on the doorposts of your house and in your city gates. Put a mezuzah. There isn't a part of our lives where there isn't a mitzvah associated. And the idea is because by doing these mitzvahs, we have these two things, which I put on the board. We have the general mitzvah, which is to take away, to make us less selfish. What's the difference between the moment before a person gets married and the moment after? Until, which is why marriages become relationships become shaky after marriage everything's really great until marriage happens it's very simple before we get married i'm focused on myself the reason i chose the other person is because i like the other person once i'm in a relationship i have to change my perspective it's not about me anymore it's it's about the other person hashem gives us mitzvahs in a general way the idea of a mitzvah is to make us less selfish, to start realizing that there's something beyond ourselves. That's the first thing. But then it wouldn't make, if it was only that, then it wouldn't make a difference if it's taking out the garbage, if it's supermarket shop, shopping, uh, clothes shopping, or going on the computer and buying something, or, or, or building a shop. It doesn't really make a difference. But then we have in a specific way, each mitzvah makes a particular part of the world more spiritually refined more generous, more aware, more respectful, more loving, more connected, etc. And by doing that, we are bringing godly revelation into this world. We are bringing about the redemption. That's what the purpose of a mitzvah is. To make a dira, a dwelling for Hashem in this world. But the question, of course, still remains. Very important question, which is going to be answered in the video that we're presentation. Um, and that is, it's all nice that I could tell you that there's a spiritual energy right here when I do a mitzvah. I mean, we're studying Torah, right? So every single one of us 
have spiritual energy that we're creating right now by either speaking the words of Torah, writing the words of Torah, listening to the words of Torah. We're all creating spiritual, spiritual energy. But what about the place in the world that doesn't have someone sitting there and studying Torah or putting on tefillin or lighting a Shabbat candle? How am I impacting that place in the world? And for that, we have our video. And uh, Elaine, you are the one I could see today. It's not Julie this time. So if you could uh, just give me a thumbs up when you hear the sound. Muster an army of workers, machines, factories, ships, trains, and endless natural supplies. What do you get? A pencil. In 1958, Leonard Reed penned a classic to document the mind-boggling diversity of materials and skilled labors required for a single manufactured object. He detailed the production of a pencil, speaking in the pencil's voice. My family tree begins with a cedar of straight grain. Contemplate all the saws and trucks and rope and the countless other gear used in harvesting and carting the cedar logs to the railroad siding. Think of all the persons and the numberless skills that went into the fabrication of these logging tools. The mining of ore, the making of steel and its refinement into saws, axes, motors, the growing of hemp and bringing it through all the stages of heavy and strong rope. Reed describes railroad networks and communication systems that bring the logs to mills and the mill work that produces thin slats. He asks, how many skills went into supplying the heat, the light and power, the belts, motors, and all the other things a mill requires? Reed includes the workers who constructed the hydro plant that supplies the mill's power, trains that transport the slats, a factory that cost millions to erect and equip with brilliant machines that slip the slats and insert the lead, and the lead itself produced by mixing graphite mined in Sri Lanka with clay from Mississippi and treating it with Mexican wax. The pencils receive six coats of lacquer and are labeled with carbon black mixed with resins. An eraser holder made of zinc and copper is attached and black nickel rings are added. Finally, the pencil's eraser is a rubber-like product made with Indonesian rapeseed oil, Italian pumice, sulfur chloride, vulcanizing and accelerating agents, and cadmium sulfide. One pencil, millions of dollars, dozens of countries, thousands of miles. But we can add something radical that Reed never considered. What if this pencil belongs to David, who uses it for Torah classes? It helps him observe the mitzvah of Torah study. That changes everything. Divinity, generated by his mitzvah, illuminates his soul and body and elevates the pencil as well. That powerful, godly light travels back along the pencil's production route, elevating the factory, railroads, minerals, investments, skills, lives, and all that Reed so vividly described. Think about that the next time you offer charity. Light a Shabbat candle or wind tefillin around your arm. With each mitzvah act, so much of this world is connected with divinity. And to think of the pencil that just fell on the floor. <laughs> it's a very powerful concept. It's really, really a powerful concept. Uh, to, to recognize that every, anything that we have, anything we look around, the amount of work, that went in to produce that. And when we use that for a mitzvah, to take flowers that went from, you know, the people cutting it, and I took it and I used it on my Shabbat table to beautify the Shabbat. That doesn't just affect the flowers that are sitting on my table, but affects the production process. And so when we do a mitzvah, it's, uh, you know, even, even just think about sitting here right now. What was involved in all of us sitting together right now, coming together to study Torah? The fact that we all have a home, 
Okay, that's one aspect, right? We're all sitting in our homes. And the fact that we have a home that was built by someone and all the materials that were built by him, that enabled us to have our home. And then we have the circumstances that brought us to that home and the education and the different experiences that we had that led us to be interested in coming to this class. All of that is refined and elevated when we're sitting and studying Torah right now. And that is the power of mitzvot that God gave to us to be able to elevate this world. So if we go back to our original question at the very beginning of tonight's class, and that was choose a mitzvah that you do regularly. Why do you do this mitzvah and select one of more of the following? Do you do it because God said so? It makes my life more orderly and stable. It makes my life more spiritual. It strengthens my Jewish identity. It feels right. It makes the world a better place. I believe that God will reward me for doing mitzvot. I'm afraid to disobey God or other. Or maybe it was all the above. Or maybe you have a new answer today. And that it's all the above, but it's really one word. It's about redemption. That's why I do the mitzvah. That means that's the ultimate uh, benefit of purpose of why I'm doing a mitzvah is not just because God told me to. That's very nice. That's elementary. It's really elementary. And, and, and I say that it's elementary. We'll truly understand that by the next part of tonight's class. So really, we're seeing, you know, we spoke about the piano and the three different worlds. And that the, if we have a piano, but the piano only serves a purpose as a piece of furniture, a decorative piece of furniture with, with, with some flowers and some picture frames on it, the piano is not serving its purpose. The purpose of a piano is to play the keys and to create or play music. And so if we're in this world and there's a piece of leather or there's coins or there's, there's opportunity, yeah, it's very nice to use the decorative aspects of this world and we'll go on nice vacations and we'll have a nice home. These are all wonderful things, but they don't serve the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose of a, of a piano is to play music, and the ultimate purpose of being in this world and using the, the, the material that God gave us, the opportunities that God gave us, for a mitzvah, to create the light, to create a dwelling place, a place for God to live in this world, that is the ultimate purpose, and that is what redemption is all about. How do we make this more real? So we go into the next section. We spoke last week about how we are God's partners. So God created the world. God wants uh, to make this world a dwelling place and how does uh, for himself, a home for himself. And how does God make this world a dwelling place, a home for himself? He does it by giving us mitzvot so that we can be his partners in revealing godly light in this world. Great idea. It's a wonderful idea. What is it based on? It's based on several different uh, sources. One of the sources is text number seven, which is from the Talmud in Mesechet Shabbat, in the tractate Mesechet Shabbat, which is the tractate of Shabbat. The Torah considers, text page 110, the Torah considers those who recite the passage of Ayahulu during the eve of Shabbat prayers as if they have become partners with God in the work of creation. The word, the verse Vayahulu is, uh, talks about the creation of heaven and earth, and one who recognizes that God is the creator of heaven and earth, and God rested, on, um, created during the week, and by, by observing Shabbat, we are testifying in a real way that God is the creator of the world, because when we observe Shabbos, we're recognizing that, yeah, God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. So when we rest on Shabbat, we are affirming that God is the creator and the ruler of this world. 
So therefore you, what does it say? You become a partner. Anyway, the, the concept of Shabbat is not really relevant here. The concept of being a partner of Hashem that we see here, that a person becomes a partner of God, that is what's relevant uh, to our discussion. So what does it mean to be a partner? So again, we're becoming partners. Why? Because God ultimately wants to have a dwelling place in this world, which is the, which is the concept of redemption. And we do it through mitzvot. But why a partner? What, what does it mean a partner? So what's the difference? Uh, let's have some, uh, some, uh, some discussion here. If, if anybody could share, um, just throw out a difference between a partner, some of the differences between a partner and an employee in a business. What would some of the differences be? Anybody want to share? You can take yourself off mute first and, and, and share. What would the, some of the differences be between, or raise your hand, and I'll ask you to speak if you want to share something. Just quick and nothing, just to create discussion. Take a little, make a little break. Elaine, go ahead. Okay, a, a partner has responsibility more than an employee. He has responsibility for the employee, for the business, in ways that the employee doesn't have the same responsibility. And, 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 and let's think about, that's very good, and, and that, that's, of course, is true. But let's go a step further. Why is that important? Why is that relevant? What difference does it make? Who's, who has more and who has less? Because it's, it's, a, it's a bigger job to be, to be the partner, to be responsible, to make sure things keep going all right. Um, it, and also, it's, it's your money. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different level. So, so, it, so it's interesting. On, on that point, this, this, there's, something, there's something more that I want to get to, which is that the motivation of a partner and which you said, it's your money, right? So if you're a partner, it's your money. Therefore, the motivation of a partner is much greater than the motivation of an employee. So what you said is the foundation. But what's the result? The result is that because it's, they're invested in the business, because they're a partner in the business, therefore, their motivation in the business is much, much greater. An employee typically is there for the paycheck, or depending what the what the business is, right? Or uh, you know, we spoke about last week. There are different businesses or different motivations. Perhaps I went into you know, it's a, it's a, a doctor's office. I want I want to help people. Okay, but I want to help people, so I'm I'm involved in the individual thing. I'm not thinking about the success of the general business. I'm thinking about my little my little part should be successful, right? So if I am um, if I am the the janitor in a build in a, in an office building. I'm very. It's a very significant job um, because I have to make sure the place is clean. And if you don't have a clean place, uh, you don't work so well. So uh, the janitor job is extremely important. But what is the janitor thinking about? He's not thinking about the success of the business. He's thinking about either his paycheck or that he should be the best janitor possible, and he should have a beautiful, clean building that when they come in the morning, they should say, Tony, you did a good job, right? That's, that's, that's what's going through his head. A partner has a much greater motivation. He's thinking about the ultimate purpose. He's not just thinking about his money. He's thinking about the success of the business. How can I make this business a better business? How can I make this business a more successful business? And the idea of us being partners in Hashem's creation means that we're not just employees. It's not just about us coming into this world, putting on our tefillin, lighting our Shabbos candles, helping our mom and dad, um, giving some charity or whatever other mitzvah we may choose to do. Not what it's all, that's not what it's all about. That's an employee. Now, the partner is going to do the same thing. But the motivation of the partner is much, much greater. 
And that's what Hashem and what the uh, sages and, and, and the Talmud are trying to teach us by understanding that we are not just employees. We weren't just appoint, appointed by God to help God make this world a better place, make this world into a dwelling place. No, it's much more. God has actually chosen us to become his partners in creation, each and every one of us. We are partners. We, it's, a, it's a different attitude towards the world. It's a different attitude towards a different motivation to, to try to accomplish it. And a greater responsibility. It's a, it's, a, it's a responsibility. Every day I'm motivated to get up and do my mitzvah. I've got to put on filling, not only because I've got to do what God wants or because it's going to benefit me because now I'm a, I'm, I'm a more disciplined person. That's a very, very, um, de- that's a detail. It's an aspect and it's true. But that's not the ultimate motivation. Why am I getting up? Why am I excited every single day? Because I am a partner with God and I've got, and I've got a goal. And what's the goal? The goal is to reveal godliness in this world, to bring around the redemption. And as a result, all the other things that we discussed in the first class and all the other things that we're going to discuss in the future classes are going to happen as a result. As a result of our mitzvot. And how do we motivate ourselves to do the mitzvot by recognizing what our, goal, what our um, job is, what our responsibility is, that we are partners. Text number eight. The Jew can argue, particularly, why is it important for me to know that the redemption will arrive someday? This is from uh, Rabbi Al Khan, which is um, was a, a teacher par excellence. Um, he still is. He's an older, very, uh, quite an old man. Um, he was one of the, uh, those who... Uh, um, repeated photographic memory, repeated the Rebbe's uh, talks and Shabbat talks word for word. An incredible individual. Um, very gifted. Anyway, so this is an article that he wrote. He, had a very inc- he has an incredible way of, of explaining ideas and making them very real. So a Jew can argue, particularly why is it important for me to know that the redemption will arrive someday? I need to do my work and fulfill that which God instructs me to do. It's not my business to know or be concerned with the greater objectives and the result of my service. Which means what what happens with my mitzvah? Who cares what happens with my mitzvah? Who cares uh, which mitzvah I do? If I have to do this mitzvah, I do this mitzvah because that's what God wants. The fallacy of this approach should be self-understood. But here is an illustration. Imagine a soldier in the midst of battle, standing up and saying, it's not my business to know why my commanding officer gave me an order to fire my weapon. All that is important is that I meticulously follow the orders handed down by the chain of command. The fact that my actions impact the outcome of the battle, causing the enemy to retreat and bringing my side closer to victory is irrelevant to me. I just need to shoot my rifle. This soldier even if he dutifully executes every order he is given, will lack morale and passion. Moreover, without a doubt, to one degree or another, it will negatively impact his performance on the battlefield. You can't be a soldier just doing actions. You need to have feelings. You need to be, you, you need to have much more than that. Now, of course, a big part of it is not doing what's on your mind, and doing what you're being told to do, and the same with mitzvot. You need to follow orders, you need to follow commands, but you need to know what your goal is. You need to know what are we trying to accomplish here. The same is true regarding to our service of God through Torah mitzvot mitzvah observance. We cannot claim that it is not our concern whether or not our service affects the long-awaited victory. We must know that there is a campaign underway and that it is our mission to bring it to to its successful conclusion. We must be keenly aware of the reality that with each additional mitzvah, we reveal more godliness in this world, thereby moving a step closer to the ultimate triumph. So the, the, the partner breathes his mission. He knows the mission statement, and he breathes that mission statement. And if we are God's partners, then we need to know what, what our mission statement is, or what God's mission statement is, because we're a partner, then it's our mission statement too. What is our mission statement? And we need to breathe that mission statement. So 
So Judaism and Torah mitzvot is all about um, is all about recognizing. Let's just go through some of the slides. Uh, why do we do a mitzvah? In order to bring Mashiach, we are partners with God in the work of creation. And we recognize that there's a difference between an employee and a partner, and that's what Judaism is all about. Judaism is all about not just the reward, but recognizing the results so that we can be motivated. And we could be excited and anticipate. So if you remember, the first thing I mentioned in week number one, in the very first lesson, I told a story about the old man who stood up and he said, it's just something to, Mashiach, the whole concept of Mashiach is just something to believe in, but he's never going to, it's never going to happen. It's, it's, it's way more than belief. It's not just belief. Yeah, we believe. Yeah, guess what? I, I also, I believe that my wife is going to make us, uh, make, make the family dinner tonight. I, I, I trust her. I trust her. I believe. I anticipate it. I look forward to it. I'm excited for it. The, the reality of Mashiach is so important, is so relevant, that it's not just something that we believe in. Yeah, we do, we're Jewish, and, and it's one of the 13 principles of faith. It actually comes at the bottom of the list, but it's more important than a lot of other things. But it's something I believe in, that distantly it will happen. What we're recognizing tonight is that the concept of Mashiach is much more than that. It's something that we, we believe and we don't think it's going to be delayed in the sense that it's such a reality. You see, when we talk about the difference between a partner and an, an employee, the partner believes in his product. He believes in the business. He believes that it's going to be success, a success. Um, but his, his, he, he, he doesn't just believe it. Yeah, I believe it. Okay, whatever. I'll believe. It. I also, I mean, I, I work for that company. I think they're going to, I think they'll do well. The, 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 for the partner, it's much more. It's a reality. In his mind, it's going to happen. We're building a new building for the business. It's going to happen. It's not just something I believe in. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think one day there'll, there'll be a building. No, it, it's a reality. It's, it's, it's something that's real. It, it really, really is, is, is something that's a reality in my life. The, the, the point is that it's, it's not just some distant belief. And that's the, the reality of, of when we recognize that Hashem created, made us as partners. And he gave us mitzvahs to be able to fulfill that, uh, that reality. So now Mashiach is not just a distant, uh, distant uh, belief, but it is something that is a reality. And something that we, 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 we anticipate, we wait for each and every single day of our lives. We're waiting for it. Um, and let's go to text number uh, C, uh, 10C, which is on page 117. And this is the actual, um, I would read the other text on my own, um, but in, in text number, uh, the other text, they have the, the 12th principle. And this is the last part of the 12th principle, um, the declaration of faith. By the by Rambam, Ani Ma'amin Bemuna Shlema Bavia Tamashiach, Biafa Pisha Yitma Mea, Im Kolze Achakelo Bechol Yom Sheavo. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of Mashiach, although he may tarry, I expectantly wait his coming every single day. So I'm not just believing in Mashiach, I await his coming every single day. And the idea is that I should await and recognize Mashiach that it's going to happen today. And text number 11 it has a story from the Talmud that is a, one of the uh, first stories that are usually shared um, about the concept of Mashiach, uh, the, ident the identity, not the identity, so, so to speak, of Mashiach, but a, a story about Mashiach where you actually have something about the conversation, a, a dialogue with Mashiach himself. So there's a, a, a story about Rabbi Yeshua and Eliyahu Hanavi, um, where Rabbi Shua comes, I'm going to read it, and asks Eliyahu Hanavi, when is Mashiach going to come? And he sends him to Mashiach himself. So this is a story about someone who actually met Mashiach. Um, 
future weeks we'll actually talk about Mashiach, but the, the, in every generation there is a potential Mashiach, so perhaps it was a potential Mashiach, or perhaps it was a spiritual uh, form of Mashiach. We're not sure exactly what this story, how it happened. A lot of spiritual stories in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Talmud. So Rabbi Shua ben Levi met with Elijah the prophet and asked him, when will Mashiach come? Elijah responded, go and ask him. Where is he located? At the gateway of the city of Rome. Why at Rome? I don't know. But what sign can I recognize him? He's sitting among the poor who suffer from illness, all the others un all untied bandages at once, and then rebandage all their wounds together. Whereas he unties and rebandages each wound separately, thinking, why does he do it? So all of them take off all their bandages and then they, you know, have time for the rest of the day. I'll uh, spend my rest of my day putting on other bandages. Where the Mashiach does one by one. Why does he do one bandage at a time? Because he says, he's always thinking to himself, perhaps I will be needed immediately to bring the redemption and my not, I must not be delayed. And therefore I do one at a time. This way I'm not, I don't have, to, people don't have to wait for me. Very considerate guy. Okay. So this is, this is Mashiach, and he's sitting at the gate of Rome, and you can go ask him when he's coming. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi went to him and greeted him, peace upon you, my master and teacher. Mashiach responded, peace on you, son of Levi. He's the son of ben Levi, Yeshua ben Levi, the son of Levi. Uh, master, when will you come? And he answers today. Wow, could you imagine going to visit Mashiach, and Mashiach tells you I'm coming today? Well, that's the one most amazing news that you could imagine. Yeshua came back to Elijah and complained. He said, he lied to me. He told me that he's coming today, but he didn't come today. Elijah responded, this is what he really told you. Today, if you will listen to his voice. The question is, today, if you listen to his voice, and giving some, some commentary, the Mashiach gave a very simple answer. He said, today, the idea that the Talmud is trying to convey to us, is trying to, and, and what Mashiach was trying to convey to Rabbi Yeshua, the son of Levi, is that the anticipation for Mashiach should be for today. The motivation of our mitzvah should be that Mashiach should come today. That is the goal, because the goal of every mitzvah is not for after 120, for the, or, or for the reward that I might make um, a little money because I gave some charity, they'll be uh, my 10%, and then God gave me back some extra uh, a donation. That, that's not what it's all about. It's much more than that. And therefore, it, the, the whole existence of this world, every mitzvah that I perform is all about revealing godliness in this world, and that's what redemption is all about. It's a very powerful concept and very empowering concept. And I'm the partner, we are the partner, that God set up. In fact, and, and, and this uh, Sunday night, Monday is uh, Shavuot. We're going to celebrate the giving of the Torah. And... Uh, Bezat Hashem, we're going to have a, a, a celebration at my place on a Monday evening. I decided I'm going to wait till the middle of this week to, to, to uh, make any uh, uh, decision on how we're going to do things uh, so that I'm, I could feel completely healthy before. And Baruch Hashem, I'm up to it. So we're going to have something. Um, we will send out something tomorrow, some information. But we're going to read the Ten Commandments and we're going to uh, uh, remember the moment and, and relive the moment that Hashem chose us to be his partners. That's what Shavuot is all about. Hashem made us his partner. And this gives us, what we study today, gives us this mo motivation to breathe Mashiach, to breathe uh, and to invest. Because if I'm a partner, I need to breathe it. I need to breathe the mission statement of Hashem, which is bringing godly revelation into this world. And I need to invest myself in it. And again, not only do I believe in it, but it's also something that is very, very real, um, that I could actually make the music on the piano. One of the, uh, I would say one, but there is no person in this, world, in this world that I know of who took this message of breathing the Hashem's mission statement of redemption more seriously than the Rebbe. He breathed it. There wasn't a talk in the 40 years of, of his leadership uh, of a, while he was in the, the physical form. I believe the rebel lives on this in, 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 very, in a very real way, spiritually. But the, the, in, the, in the Rebbe's 
in, in the 40 years that we heard the Rebbe speak, there wasn't a Fabrengen, a time the Rebbe spoke, that he did not mention Mashiach. I mean, you can talk about discipline. Perhaps it was discipline, but it wasn't. It was, you know, there are people who are just so invested in, 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 a, in a, an idea that everything that they do is connected to that idea. I, I think I, I mentioned this last week, I think, or the week before. I, I, know, I know the spot I was sitting in. I don't remember which week it was. So it, when we're invested in something, we, everything we think about is connected. How am I going to connect this, the menorah to the, we think about the menorah in the Beit HaMikdash when I'm studying about the menorah, I'm thinking about Mashiach. Chanukah, I'm thinking about everything I do, I think about Mashiach. And that's the Rebbe's life was like that. That every single idea, he somehow drove it at the end into the coming of Mashiach because he recognized that is the ultimate mission statement. That's why we're here. That's the purpose. And uh, therefore, in order to be enthusiastic and motivated so that we can actually reach that moment, to push ourselves to do more, to be able to prepare for it and to reach that moment, the Rebbe constantly spoke about it and, and, and reminded us uh, of this mo mo motivation. So we're going to finish tonight's class um, and then we'll do the key points. Uh, we're going to finish tonight's class uh, with this text that I want to read. Um, from the Rebbe, text number 13, page 125, and we'll conclude with this. We've been discussing the redemption of the era of Mashiach. Some in the audience are genuinely out astounded at this, although for obvious reasons, they do not openly voice their amazement. So apparently the Rebbe sensed that people were not appreciating his overzealous, uh, so to speak, uh, discussions about Mashiach and making the topic of Mashiach and redemption, which as I mentioned in the first week, uh, which was, you know, besides, you know, when someone was suffering and spoke about Mashiach, for the most part, it remained in prayer. And the Rebbe was the one who sort of, uh, who in a very big way, brought this idea to the public so that now today, uh, in all Jewish groups, the topic of Mashiach is discussed and becoming very, very real. It's amazing. So the Rebbe continues. It seems that people are, are, are a little surprised at how I'm, uh, you know, discussions of Mashiach. How can an individual appear in public week after week and repeatedly and unceasingly discuss a single subject, the coming of Mashiach? Moreover, this individual, the Rebbe doesn't speak about I, but talks about an individual, emphasizes that he is not merely discussing the public Torah materials on this topic, Rather, he is discussing our righteous Mashiach's actual coming in a tangible reality here on physical earth, which means until now, this was a discussion, a theoretical discussion. It was a faith of about a Mashiach that might come in, in the, the end of exile. Who knows when that will be? Not up to us. We shouldn't even think about it. And immediately on this very day, Shabbos Parshas Pinchas 5744, which was 1984, this individual further instructs others to sing on each and every occasion, may the holy temple be, rebuilt, be built speedily in our days. And he points out that speedily in our days does not refer to the very near future. It means quite literally speedily today. Certainly, says the Rebbe, every Jew believes that Mashiach can come at any moment. In keeping with one of the fundamentals of Jewish faith that states, I await his coming every day. Nevertheless, they wonder how it is justified to discuss this topic without let up, and to emphasize on each occasion that Mashiach can come at that very moment. It is not rather, is it not rather challenging to expect people to relate to Mashiach's imminence as if it were a tangible fact of reality? So why does this individual speak incessantly about this on every occasion and with such single-minded intensity as if it's as if to forcefully ram the idea into the minds of his listeners. Well, the Rebbe accomplished it, but the Rebbe wants, is questioning, why am I doing this? Their conclusion is that all this is a beautiful dream. And as we recite in our prayers, may all my dreams be positively fulfilled for me and for all of Israel. Nice, but not realistic. If so, they claim there is truly no point in discussing one's dreams as, at such length and with such frequency. The truth is, says the Rebbe, however, is precisely the opposite. 
Reb Shnir Zaman of Liadi delivered a discourse based on the verse, when God returns the exiles of Israel, we shall be as those who have dreamed. He explained that our current state of exile is comparable to a dream, because in a dream, one's sense of perception can tolerate the most contradictory and irrational things. In other words, our current reality, says the Rebbe, is a dream. Whereas the world of Mashiach is our true reality. So here's a very, very important point that we want to make here. We could look at the whole concept. One idea that we spoke about is that this is the mission, God's mission statement and we are partners. But still, the ultimate will happen maybe in some years to come. However, when we start to realize that the, the reality of this world, which is olam, which is concealment, is not the true reality. It's just a dream because the true reality of this world is godliness, right? So if we're not seeing godliness, we're not seeing the true reality. As long as I see the table as a table and I don't see the godliness within the table, I, I don't see the true reality. The moment I turn the table into a, Shabbat, into a table with guests and for mitzvahs and to study Torah and to eat for, for holy purposes, then I've recognized that the table is a, is, is, is a spiritual reality, is godliness. And then I'm seeing the, the real reality. But until that point, what am I seeing is a dream. I'm not seeing the true reality. That's what a dream is. I'm seeing a, a, a dream. Whereas the world of Mashiach is our true reality. In a single moment, the situation can be reversed from at one extreme to another. So if I recognize that this is a dream and this is not the true reality, and the true reality exists, it's not that I'm creating the, the true reality. It's not that one day God is going to give a, a, a treat to us for all the mitzvot that we did. That's not what's going to happen. It's that what is happening is we are changing by doing mitzvot over the last 2,000 years. We are slowly changing that reality. And all it takes is one moment to wake up and to recognize that this world is filled with godliness, and that's the true reality of this world. And that can happen at any moment. We can awaken from the dream of exile and enter the true reality of the actual state of redemption. If so, says the Rebbe, just going to jump over here. If so, says the Rebbe, if so, says the Rebbe, each and every individual present in this room certainly has the ability to make the redemption come immediately. Not tomorrow or in the near future, but right now in this Shabbat, Parshat Pinchas, uh, 5744, which is 1984, before we have a chance to recite the afternoon prayers, simply state it. At this very moment, we open our eyes and see Mashiach in the flesh with us here in this room. We could see that reality. It's just, it's a matter of just a moment. And it's a matter of recognizing that that's our purpose. That's what this is all about. That's why we're here. That's why Hashem created us. That's why Hashem created this reality so that we could turn it over. That's what Mashiach is all about. That's what re redemption is really all about. And uh, this is a, a very, very important, very fundamental class. It's, 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 um, I think it's, it's, this is a, a class that we need to, to sit for a moment and allow it to penetrate, allow it to settle, to internalize the message, and then hopefully to allow the message to motivate us in the performance of mitzvahs so that we can do what it takes on our part to be a good partner, to be a true partner in making this reality. And as the Rebbe says, and, and throughout Torah, it doesn't take a whole world to be Mashiach. Maimonides says it takes one person, because if you think of a scale, if you have... Um, two sides of the scale and they're equal right now, what does it take to tip it? One, one mitzvah, one of air, right? It just takes one, one, one item and, and we've tipped the scale. So it doesn't take a lot to bring Mashiach. It takes the person who's motivated to make that a reality, to make the world, world a reality where we start seeing godliness in this world and then the whole world changes as a result, as a natural result. So let's go over the uh, key points and uh, conclude this class and take a moment afterwards to say goodnight to each other. Lesson three, superhuman versus superhumans. One, the purpose of creation, according to Hasidic teachings, is God's desire for a home in our material world and corporeal reality. Two, the physical world is referred to as the lowly world because it obscures the truth that God pervades every aspect of existence. Making the world a home for God 
means to penetrate this concealment and transform physical reality into a place that expresses the divine goodness and perfection. 3. The Messianic world is not only a reward for doing mitzvot, but is the actual result of these actions. A mitzvah transforms the object with which it is performed from a self-defined existence into an instrument of God's will. In addition, each mitzvah makes a particular part of the world more receptive to spirituality, bringing it one step closer to expressing the divine goodness and perfection. 4. The mitzvot directly engage with only a small percentage of the physical universe and of each individual life. But each mitzvah action is the product of countless other actions and processes. In this way, the whole of creation is ultimately transformed. 5. The sages teach us that by doing mitzvot, we become a partner with God in the work of creation. There are a number of distinctions between a partner mentality and an employee mentality. A. An employee is driven primarily by his or her job description, whereas for the partner, the company's mission statement is the driving force. An employee is motivated by reward, whereas a partner is results driven. C. A partner is confident of the success of the enterprise. 6. The twelfth foundation of Judaism, by Maimonides' count, is not only the belief that Mashiach will come, but also the daily anticipation of the redemption. When we understand that the true nature of reality is the divine goodness and perfection, the expectation of Mashiach's imminent coming is more realistic than the concealment that obscures this truth.